Okay, and welcome. Uh, this is a little extra video because we're talking about the respiratory system and obviously COVID-19 is a major respiratory infection, right? And some of the stuff I'll be talking about is what goes wrong in a major infection that is a really bad infection. And, you know, watching this, some people tend to naturally freak out a little bit, just like medical students do when they're learning about all these diseases, they tend to think they have everything, right? So I want to touch upon a little bit of the epidemiology of it, just so you have a better idea of your own risk assessment, as well as risk to others in any particular cohort. So here's a nice graph. This turns out to be from the Santa Clara County COVID-19 demographics dashboard. And it just lays out the kind of some nice features of the graph right here, right? So what I want you to notice here is the number of cases that is known infections in any particular age group. So what you'll notice is your age group around here are making up a large percentage of the cases. And this might be reflecting either the, the fact that this makes up a larger portion of the population and the fact that they're out and about, they're working and they're much more likely to catch it. All right, so we want to look at this case number over here, look at the trend toward based on these age groups. And then if we look at the actual deaths, right, we'll see this difference in how these numbers cluster, right? So for 60 and above, this makes up something like 80% of the actual deaths from COVID. And then the other important thing to realize here is that this population from 60 above is making up something like only 15% of the population, right? So it's very highly clustered as a matter of age. And also notice down here, you also have this comorbidities, underlying health conditions were present in all age groups in something like 80% of the cases, right? So this is just to kind of give you an idea of the where these kind of cases of deaths rather are clustering, right, versus the cases. So another page to look at over here is the CDC website where they look at different scenarios and try to estimate the infection fatality ratio, the IFR. I mean, I'll look at this scenario five, the current best estimate, right? These are all estimates, these are all models, but for your age group, which might be something around here, right? you have this number right here, which will translate into something like a one in 5,000 chance of dying if you get infected, right? And this goes between this rather large age group and probably you're something closer to this one down here, which translates into something like a one in 33,000, right? versus this, which is a one in 10,000 chance of dying, right? So it all is going to be a gradient uh, as you get older. So for me, you know, which I'm closer to around here, my chance is going to be something like a one in 200 chance of dying if I got infected. Again, I'm a little bit closer to this, so I'm probably something like a one in 5,000 chance of dying, right? So those are your risks, yours and my risk assessments, if you get infected. None of this says anything about getting sick or not, right? The percentage of people who are thought to be asymptomatic is something like 40%. And between asymptomatic and actually dying, you know, you have everywhere from getting mildly sick to getting very sick to being hospitalized to end up in the ICU and getting ventilated and dying, right? So there's a whole range of stuff that could happen in between, right? And then when we get down here where we, we're gonna see this most deadly group where it turns out to something like one in 20 chance, right? At the most vulnerable people and even higher as you get older right there. So this is where most of your numbers are coming from despite the fact that they make up a smaller percentage of the population, right? So all this is to say, you know, for your own risk assessment, what is the danger for you personally? And, you know, some people will call that very risky. Some people will not worry about that at all. That's going to be your own sort of 
how you feel about how you assess that kind of risk. But there's also the very obvious fact that as the virus spreads more throughout the population, it'll reach this much more vulnerable group. Right? So if you're living with older people, if you're living with a more vulnerable population, that's when you have to start really being more careful. And then obviously that's your own personal assessment, but imagine you're the governor of a state and then you're gonna be blamed not only for all the deaths, but you're also gonna be blamed for the economic fallout and social kind of consequences of any policy that you enact to kind of prevent these deaths, right? So that's just a little bit of the background before we get into the biology of it. Again, I just wanna kind of touch on maybe some of the background of this for anybody who hasn't taken micro in a while, right? So when we're talking about the coronavirus, right? It's a little, little kind of not organism. It's not technically considered alive, right? Because it can't replicate itself outside some kind of living organisms, like anything from a bacteria to a human, right? Once it gets inside it, it can kind of hijack the cell's machinery and start replicating itself, right? Outside of it, right? Uh, it usually doesn't exist, it's not that hardy. It's got a little shell around it, but inside it's either DNA or RNA, you know, it can virus in different forms. In our case, the coronavirus is, is RNA. And if it's exposed, you know, if it's sitting outside on a surface or something, usually it, it is degraded, you know, and especially soap and everything will wash all that away pretty easy, right? But once it's inside the body and can get inside a cell, that's a different story. But even though you're just, you know, some people are just becoming sort of more familiar with these terminologies, right? It's, it, that's an important point that it's only going to be uh, kept alive by sort of being inside a host, right? But there's viruses like everywhere, right? This is actually a herpes simplex virus on a simple in a, a squamous cell over here that you can see like the scale of it. You know, a squamous cell is something like maybe five microns across or something. So these are tiny little guys. And they're, you know, this is showing them trying to get inside the cell. They have to gain entry inside the cell somehow. But in this case, this was from a, um, this was from a, uh, a study that's looking at the link between Alzheimer's, right, and her or some kind of virus infection inside the brain, <clears throat> right? So, you know, what virologists, you know, if you read them enough, you'll see that so many of our common diseases like autoimmune diseases, cancers, and stuff start with these kind of viral infections, right? Everybody knows HPV, right, that causes cervical cancer. It's just a virus that got in there through uh, usually sexually transmitted contact, right? Or HIV, certainly another a bloodborne pathogen. But you know, so they get inside your body in different ways. But they're everywhere. There's all these viruses that we don't know about. They don't know, for instance, you know, they didn't know until they knew it that HPV, that cervical, that certain types of cervical cancer were caused by that virus, right? And they're finding out more and more with a lot of the autoimmune diseases, stuff like lupus, multiple sclerosis. All those might be virus caused. That's why, you know, there's a big concern about all the unknowns about the coronavirus, right? We just don't know. But, you know, could be anything, could be nothing, you don't know yet. But so for the coronavirus, right, there's all sorts of coronaviruses floating around out there. A lot of them, like the ones listed here, this is from 2003. They were, you know, the com more of the common cold coronaviruses uh, that are floating around that uh, don't really cause a big effect in you, know, maybe because they've been around, maybe whatever, right? But in other animals, there's all sorts of coronavirus. And in our case, COVID, SARS, COVID-2 is something that might have, they think probably got from one of these, I'm not sure if one of these, but one of those uh, bat viruses, right? That kind of jumped species, right? That's what they think is going on based on, you know, looking at the genomics and doing comparisons and stuff. They think it came from one of these guys somewhere in uh, Wuhan or somewhere in China, right? So it, they're all around, right? They're all around and once in a while, something like this will happen, right? It'll happen every once in a while. So for our guy, it's a, you know, what you call airborne, that is it can travel in respiratory droplets. This picture is showing the viruses, but you know, they're not floating around naked in the air, floating around and waiting to be breathed in, right? They're gonna be contained within a, some kind of respiratory droplet that's 
that comes out of people's mouth when they're talking, singing, coughing, sneezing, all that stuff, they're floating around the air, right? And so why is this one such a big deal? Number one, from an epidemiology standpoint, it just transmits very easy because most of the people, or I should say the majority of people who get it do not, they either totally don't get sick at all or they get mildly symptomatic, right? So they don't go home, isolate themselves in bed. They're walking around, spreading around, right? That's one of the first weird things is that, you know, you think of it as, you know, you cause probably something like 300,000 deaths, but on the other hand, for any individual, it's not so deadly. It doesn't even get you sick. It's just that it's so widespread that you're going to get big numbers in everything we look at right there, right? So that's one reason uh, it's so deadly, right? It's floating around in the air and people get it and they don't know it and they pass it on. So I just want to show this uh, slide here about the scale of what we're talking about here. Right? This is from a New York Times article and they're talking about mass and stuff, right? But so they're looking at the, this is like looking in close in. Right? so right around here, these are respiratory droplets that the virus would be traveling in, right? You got big ones coming out from sneezes and coughs are bigger than this. And then you got very small ones, right? The size of an actual virus is not too much smaller than this very small sort of what they call aerosol droplets that kind of float around in the air for a long time, right? But on the other hand, they do float around the air. They'll stay around in the air for a while. They'll travel around, you can breathe it in, but there's not, you know, there's only maybe one virus in them, which is not that much. Your body can fight that off, right? Whereas these large ones could have a bunch of viruses in them, right? But they tend to fall toward the ground more, right? So even though there's more of them, they tend to fall down to the ground. These, which do tend to float around, are gonna be at breathe in. Uh, they only have, you know, and, less viruses in them, right? And viral load is a big deal on how sick you get, right? Because your body can fight off maybe a hundred viruses, but once you get to a thousand viruses, it starts to get more tricky, right? Your body becomes, your immune system becomes overwhelmed. All right, so I just wanted to kind of get that for scale, right? So the last thing I'll mention about these respiratory droplets is that the more you breathe in, the more viruses you'll take in, and the bigger the viral load uh, is, that you get will probably be a big factor in how sick that you get. So one thing that's a hypothesis going around is that the virus is causing a lot less deaths than it was initially. One thing that might be happening is the mass, which are not completely uh, blocking the virus from exiting or entering the respiratory tract. Uh, it probably does decrease the viral load. So that along with that this social distancing that people are more generally practicing is probably one factor in how the virus is somehow less deadly than it was last spring. So the virus spreads through respiratory droplets and it's spread by asymptomatic people, which means it's spread, it's widespread throughout the population. And then the second thing that makes it so infectious is that once it does get in your respiratory tract, it is very efficient in getting inside the cells of your body. And it does that by binding to this ACE2 receptor here very strongly. And these receptors are found all over the respiratory tract. So here's where we're starting to get into the actual respiratory system, right? So the virus gets in, the, the droplet bursts, and all the viruses come out of it. And now they're around your, let's say if you breathe it into your nose, into your nasal epithelia, right? And from there, it's got a way to get inside the cell through these receptors, which if you've taken physio or when you take physio, you'll learn about this whole pathway, right, that they can bind to these receptors. And this, what this does is to make the cell, grows around the cell, takes it in the cell. Once it's in the cell, the RNA within the virus can be released and kind of hijack the cell's machinery to make more copies of itself. And then that's when the immune system is going to mount the res response, right? And that's where the damage starts to happen once it gets inside the cell. And the thing about these ACE2 receptors is they're all over your respiratory tract, right? They're also in the blood vessels. They're all over the place in reality, right? And so anywhere that the virus can get in and get to them, they can get inside these cells. I don't think this is quite the scale there, right? But here it's showing the virus 
infecting the ACE2, expressing nasal epithelial cells in the upper respiratory tract. Right? So these are all terminologies which you'll be familiar with once we get down. Nasal epithelia, what types of cells are these right here? You know, where are they found, right? So where, where's vulnerable to these uh, type of entry into your body? They're not getting in through your skin. They're getting in through some kind of opening, wherever these receptors are. So when stuff is breathed in, a lot of the larger particles or the first stuff that's caught is going to be caught up in this upper respiratory region. That some stuff is small enough or, you know, if it replicates enough and shed down into your little air sacs deep within your lungs right there. So when these viruses, and this could be influenza, it could be coronavirus, it could be a common cold coronavirus, any of those get inside these, your little air sacs right here is going to mount some kind of immune response by these macrophages, which say, hey, there's an invader, call in the troops. And then other cells of the immune system move in to fight off the infection, right? Which will include, you know, an inflammatory response as well as destroying all the cells that have been infected, right? So the inflammatory response, which is needed to fight it off, can also cause some damage by itself. One of the things that happens during these inflammatory responses is you get this accumulation of fluid within these little air sacs right there, right? So this inflammation part, uh, starts happening from the virus, but then the immune system really kicks in. And depending on how bad it kicks in, right, you get this severest response, which is going to cause these secondary problems, right? So in this case, here's a little graphic right here, little air sacs in your lungs, the air is coming in, and here's the blood vessels right around here. So you'll see blood vessel come in, do the gas exchange. Here, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. And then down here with this inflamed tissue right here and fluid buildup, right, the oxygen's coming in, but it's not. there's not a whole lot of gas exchange going on because this whole air sac area has been filled up with fluid. And there's also other problems associated down here with this inflamed membrane right there that could cause scarring and stuff. Right, so something like this, this is a, you know, a CT scan of lungs with someone with severe case of coronavirus where you have pneumonia and maybe scarring in here, right? These are the nice, you know, clear branches, but then certain segments of it have got the infection within it. And then they cause these sort of abnormalities, abnormalities in the lungs. So the other thing, as I said, once the immune system kicks in, right, not only do you get you know, that fluid buildup, which is pneumonia, but you also get this severe damage of the air sacs, the lining, the, the cells lining the air sacs, as well as the capillaries, right, which are surrounding them and bringing the oxygen in, right? So here, the alveolar, the air sac walls are being destroyed. The soft tissue around it, like the connective tissue around it, is going to, in the subsequent repair process, you're going to get what's called uh, you know, fibrosis. That is, you scar build up, collagen build up within here once, these, once this whole area starts to get repaired. That itself also causes some problems, as we'll see. So anytime you get these respiratory, nasty respiratory infections, the regeneration process is involved the formation of scar tissue, right? So if you have lung fibrosis, that's going to result in these longer term changes of gas exchange efficiency based on these anatomical changes that are a result of that. So that's beyond the acute phases, which you may see in the more severe infections where you get things like pneumonia and that decreased gas efficiency there. So I want to mention that these are the more severe cases. Most of the people who are getting infected are able to fight it off uh, before it gets to this point. But those are the things that might be more relevant to today's respiratory system lectures. And so you can take it for what it is, especially my armchair epidemiology in the beginning. So that's it for this special edition. See you later.